Welcome to Rise Community Church Online. We're happy that you're joining us today. Uh, obviously, we miss each other terribly, and we are looking forward to the day that we can gather together again. Uh, but we're going to continue to give you guys updates. Uh, as we explained before, the schools are still closed, and we are hoping that uh, that will be changed uh, soon so that we can begin to see each other again. But with that, let's, uh, let's just go before the Lord. Let's really be thankful for all that God uh, is doing in our lives and in the, in the ministry here at Rice Community. Uh, remember, uh, during the week, to lift up your brothers and sisters that are hurting and that are in need. Uh, let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, Lord, your work. Lord, we pray that you will, Lord, speak to our hearts, even as we prepare our hearts to worship now and to listen to the word of God, your word. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us and help us to be sensitive to hear what your spirit is saying, Lord. Help us to see those in need and pay attention, Lord, to our community and to our neighbors and to those that work with us and to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, help us to be your hands and feet as you have called us to be. Lord, we pray for the nation and the world that is desperate, Lord, for hope. And Lord, we know that you are our only hope. We love you, Father. We pray that you will bless this time, that you'll bless your people, and Lord, that we will truly, truly reflect your love to all that we need, and that we will raise up your holy banner. We love you, and we ask this in your holy name. Amen. Now join me as we worship the Lord in song.
to my rescue and I want to be where you are. Yes, I called, you answered, and you came to my rescue, and I want to be where you are. One more time. Yes, I called, you answered. came to my rescue and I want to be where you There's a grace when your heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There's another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the walls, holding back the sun. Should I ever need to remind how I've been set free? There's a cross that bears the burden, another died for me. There's another in the fire. 
There's no one in me with a name that has changed. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So what may the space between what remains of me and the things unseen? I know I will never be alone. There's no other name. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yes, I know. darkness. 
nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between Should I ever make you mine? How good you've been to me. Let the joy come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be. And he is jealous. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me jealous. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, oh, and I realize just how beautiful you are, and how great your affections are for me, and oh, how he loves us so.
passion by the grace in his eyes and if grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have the time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh, he loves us oh, our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes if grace is an ocean I'm sinking and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have the time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, us. Sing that out. He loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us online today. My name is Cynthia. I just want to give you a couple updates that are going to be happening during the week. Every single night of the week at 7.30, we have prayer, and we have an extra prayer session on Sundays at 9 o'clock right before service. And on Wednesday nights, our youth meet on Instagram. Don't miss that. I've heard it's really good. And also on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, Pastor Pete takes us into a deeper dive of Acts. On Thursdays, every single week, the men meet at seven o'clock and the women will be meeting this week because they meet every first and third Thursday of the month. Please, if you need prayer, let us know. You can email us at prayer at risecommunity.org. And hey, if you've not tried getting on our website or you don't have our app, please jump on our website and download the app so you know what's going on with our church. Thank you and have a great day. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rise Community Church Online. My name is Pastor John. And this week, we're going to be continuing our study through the book of Acts. Last week, Pastor Pete taught through Acts chapter 8, and he taught us that we can be zealous in our beliefs, but we can also be wrong. And so will we allow God's Word to correct our thinking? And will we take inventory to make sure that our zealous beliefs result in actions that bear fruit for Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and pray this morning. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you will put your word, Lord, deep into our souls and so that it comes out, Lord, in actions that bear fruit for you, Lord, for your honor and for your glory. And we ask all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message covers Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 31. And this section of verses in the Bible is really the first place that we're introduced to Saul of Tarsus. We commonly refer to him as Paul or the Apostle Paul. Now, it's a common myth that after Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, that Jesus changed Saul's name to Paul. But that's not really true. Saul continues to be called Saul even by the Holy Spirit. And we find examples of this later in the book of Acts, chapters 11, 12, and, and also 13. One example is in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, and it reads, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, and from then on Luke, who is the author of Acts, continues to call 
him Paul. Now, it was not uncommon for people in that day to have two names. And so the theory is that Luke began calling him Paul because that name would be more familiar to the Gentiles. Now, a little background information on Saul. Saul was born about the same time as Jesus Christ. He was a native of Tarsus, the capital of Cilicia, which was a Roman province on the southeast of Asia, Asia Minor. This city stood on the banks of the river Sidnus, and it became a center of extensive commercial traffic in that era. It was also a city distinguished for its wealth. Saul's father was of the straightest sect of the Jews. He was a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. Unfortunately, we know nothing about Saul's mother. We read of Saul's sister and his sister's son in Acts 23 and other relatives in Romans chapter 16. Though a Jew, Saul's father was born a Roman citizen, and that made Saul a freeborn child. Now, according to Jewish custom, Saul learned a trade before entering into a higher education. And Saul's trade was making tents from goat hair cloth. Now, some also say that Saul was a baker because the Bible tells us at one point Saul left and went to Philippi. Just seeing if you're awake. After his preliminary education was complete, Saul became a student of the celebrated rabbi Gamaliel. And under Gamaliel, he spent many years in deep study of the scripture. Now, after Pentecost, Christianity began to spread rapidly in Jerusalem. And the Sanhedrin felt threatened, so persecution rose against Stephen and the followers of Christ. Saul took a very active role in this persecution, and he really became the leader of this persecution. Now, since the church was being persecuted, it scattered. And in the scattering, the gospel was spread even further. This angered Saul even more. And this is where we pick up today's message in Acts chapter 9. Now, instead of reading all 31 verses, I'm just going to do a summary for you. Saul went to the high priest to get court orders to arrest Christians. And after the high priest gave him these arrest orders, Saul got onto the road to Damascus with the intent of stopping the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was almost to Damascus when a blinding light from heaven encircled him. And this light was so intense that it brought Saul to his knees. A voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul was overwhelmed and he asked, Who are you, master? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now Saul couldn't see because the light had blinded him. And so the men that were with him helped him walk the rest of the, rest of the way into Damascus. When Saul got to Damascus, he was so overwhelmed that he didn't sleep or eat. I'm sorry, he didn't eat or drink for three days. Now, at the same time, the Lord told Ananias, who was a disciple of Jesus, go pray for Saul in order to restore his vision and fill him with the Holy Spirit. And so Ananias followed the Lord's instructions and Saul's vision was restored. A few days later, he went out and got baptized. A few days after Saul was baptized, he began boldly preaching the word of God and through his preaching, proving that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, this upset the religious leaders, and that now they put Saul on their hit list. They tried to kill him, but he escaped to Jerusalem. Well, the religious leaders in Jerusalem tried to kill him too. So Saul left, and he went to Tarsus. He continued to spread the gospel, and the church enjoyed a time of peace after this. Now let's take a closer look at a few of the verses in chapter 9. The Bible uses very strong language to start out chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. In other words, Saul lived, breathed, and ate, stopping the spread of the gospel. 
Have you ever heard one say, man, this, this person lives, breathes, and eats football, or this person lives, breathes, and eats shopping? We say this to describe how passionate this person is about that activity, what drives them, what occupies their thoughts. And in many, ca- many cases, it's really more than a hobby. It has become a cause. Hunting down these so-called blasphemous believers was Saul's cause. He spent a lot of time and effort in doing it. He sought out the highest religious authorities so that he could hunt down Christians and not be questioned at all. Now here's an opportunity for us to learn an important lesson about seeking higher authority. Saul knew that in order to fight his battle against Christians, he needed authority from a court. It's really not much different today, is it? We need court orders for all kinds of things. Child custody battles, restraining orders, bankruptcies, even in religious rulings. And in some cases, if we're not happy with the results, we can appeal to a higher court. And in very rare circumstances, this case might go all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, unfortunately, you and I don't have access to the Supreme Court, do we? Because they hear only about 80 cases a year, so it'd be very rare, and you'd be very fortunate to have your case heard by the Supreme Court. But no matter what court your case is heard in, how do you demonstrate that your case has merit? Well, you do it through litigation. After the judge hears your case and examines the law, a ruling is made. Now here's the good news for Christians. As a citizen of heaven and as a child of God, we don't have to go through lower courts and appeals processes to get to the highest court. Through Jesus Christ, we have direct access to the highest court in the universe. And you can access this court anytime. This court sits in the spiritual realm and it has one judge. And as a matter of fact, this judge just happens to be your father. So don't worry. Your case will be heard immediately. You're in the circle of trust. Well, how do I access that court, John? Well, you litigate your case through prayers and petitions. How do I demonstrate to the judge that my case has merit? Well, you do it through the laws of the land. Well, what are the laws of the land and and where are they found? Well, they're, they're found right here in God's Word. Now, these laws operate in the spiritual realm. These laws are higher than any of man's laws. To litigate means to decide and settle in a court of law. So when a ruling takes place in the spiritual realm, it affects the physical realm. When it's settled in heaven, it's done on earth. The question here is, do we believe God's word? Do we have faith in his word? When we pray, we should pray believing in God's word and how it applies to the situation that we're in. As children of God and as citizens of heaven, if we want something done on earth, we need to appeal to the highest court. We don't identify ourselves as being left or right. We're from above. We're citizens of heaven. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is in the spiritual realm. It's in the heavenlies. So when we see chaos in the streets, and chaos in our political systems, our battle is not with other human beings. And when I say battle, our battle is not to sway people to the left or to the right. Our battle is up and down. We don't want people to go down. We want people to go up to heaven. As children of God, you and I are fighting for souls. If we want to see revival and repentance in our country, then we need to fight that battle on our knees. We need to bring our thoughts and beliefs into alignment with God's Word. 
And then we need to bring that case before Almighty God. An example would be God's word says that he is willing that none should perish. So the best thing we can do for people is to point them to Jesus. If you have other cases that you would like to bring to the court, for example, maybe you're upset about the way your boss is treating you at work. Well, make sure to bring your actions into alignment with God's word. The Bible says whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. Now, after your actions are in alignment with God's word, then bring your case before your heavenly father with prayers and petitions. The Bible says in John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The key here is to believe what God has spoken in his word and then declare it in faith. Approach his throne boldly, not once, not twice, but continually and faithfully. Stand firm over a period of time. That's the type of faith that pleases God. Now, maybe you struggle with believing God's word. Well, then we need to keep reciting his word until our mind is renewed It might take walking around the house an hour a day reciting God's word until our flawed thinking is changed. And this is important because our beliefs drive our actions. Joshua 1.8 says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, continuing on with Saul, Saul would have never gone to court and got authority to persecute the church if he really knew the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Saul had religion, but he didn't have Jesus. Because Saul only had religion, he became passionate for a cause instead of being passionate for a person. The other day, I came across this website that was dedicated to informing people about who was a false teacher of Jesus Christ. This person's proving process was to take a teacher's sentence out of context and then provide a Bible verse showing how that sentence was not biblical. In addition, if this teacher or preacher was on stage with another false teacher, then they too were labeled as a false teacher never giving any of these teachers a chance to explain themselves, never taking in the totality of what they were saying. It was hours and hours of podcasts and a laundry list of accusations. You see, in in their zealousness, this person has wandered way off track with a cause. Instead of pointing people to Jesus and encouraging them to walk in the Lord, it's become all about the cause of investigating false teachers. We're so easily distracted, aren't we? So many things in our lives can turn into a cause. 18 years ago, when I first moved to Florida, my cause was scuba diving. I was wreck diving and reef diving and and cave diving. My marriage and my relationship with God took second place to my cause of scuba diving. At one point, Maria told me, You better slow down or you're going to be dumpster diving. Video games were a cause in my life. I spent 30 hours a week at least playing video games. And let me tell you, Maria started to become one angry bird before I turned off the PlayStation and stepped up to the real Call of Duty. Christian books were a cause in my life at one point. I told myself that I needed to learn all I could about Christianity. But then one day the Lord said, Son, you stopped reading my word. Now, none of those things are inherently wrong, but in my life there was no healthy balance. It's so easy to go from one cause to another in our lives. In my own life, I have to constantly examine myself. 
Is something pulling me away from worshiping God? Is anything bumping me off course? Am I becoming passionate about a cause? My friends, an inch off course today can become a mile before we know it. When we encounter Saul in Acts chapter 9, he's way off course and fighting for a religious cause. Saul had religion, and Saul knew the scriptures, but he didn't know the one who could save him because Saul worshipped a cause instead of a person. Now this is how Saul became zealous for Jesus. Acts 9, 3-5 says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Saul was saying, Who are you, sir? Who are you, master? He didn't know or recognize the voice of the one who was calling him. Now, Paul recognized that this person was someone of great authority, but he didn't know who he was. Jesus had to tell him. Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, because Saul needed some help in realizing who Jesus was, Jesus showed Paul more than a voice. Jesus allowed Paul to see a little bit of his resurrected glory, holiness, and power. This wasn't twinkling starlight. This wasn't a soft, gentle ray that warms our skin and and gives us vitamin D. This wasn't just a bright light that makes us squint our eyes. A window was opened in heaven, and Saul was able to see some of the majestic glory of a holy, omnipotent God. Saul's experience was not unique either. There's other examples in the Bible about people who were allowed to see some of the glory of God. And this is important. Because it seems to me, in light of the many messages that are being preached across the world and in this country, that many people have forgotten or minimized, or maybe they're blinded to the fact of the holiness of God, His power, and His glory. So in Deuteronomy 5, 23-27, we read, The Lord our God has shown us His glory and His majesty, and we have heard His voice from the fire. Today we have seen that a person can live even if God speaks with them. But now, why should we die? This great fire will consume us and we will die if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer. For what mortal has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us, Whatever the Lord our God tells you, we will listen and obey. The prophet Isaiah also saw God in a vision, and he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each had six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." The Bible also tells us that the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of God, and afterwards he sat down for seven days deeply distressed. The prophet Daniel had visions, and these visions wore him out, and he lay down exhausted for several days. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not preaching an unapproachable God who is far off from his followers. What I'm preaching is this awesome, holy God is pursuing you, just like he pursued Saul. He pursues you and I for a relationship. It's Emmanuel, God with us, 
He desires to be connected to us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. After Saul met Jesus and saw His glory and His majesty, he just simply wanted nothing else. Knowing Jesus is our highest calling and our highest purpose is to be in a relationship with our Creator and to worship Him for who He is. You are special to God. Consider for a moment, the most awesome being in the universe wants to be with you. And He's a loving God who meets us on our road to Damascus. You see, Jesus' cause is you. And He proved it by dying on the cross. He also reveals Himself to us in His Word, in nature, in our circumstances, in our blessings. For the believer, knowing and worshiping God is a place of rest and joy. And when we're in His presence, our lives are altered. After being in the presence of Jesus Christ, Saul's life was altered. His beliefs were changed. You see, when we're zealous for Jesus, we won't go off track with a cause. When we're zealous for Jesus Christ, our cause is Christ. In Philippians 3, 7 through 8, we read, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. After Saul realized who Jesus was, he, he counted his previous cause and his great religious knowledge as garbage, especially in the new light of knowing Jesus Christ. The truth is, when we know Jesus and we worship Him because of who He is, our priorities will change. The Bible says in Proverbs 9-10, through 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Maybe you're thinking, John, how do I, how do I get that fire back? How do I reconnect with God? How do I know more of Jesus Christ? It starts with worship, my friend. Worship is the answer. Worship is the antidote. Worship is the pipeline. It's going back to our first love, that love and fire for Jesus that we had when we first met Him, when He revealed Himself to us. And we do it through worship. Not just once a week, but during the week, during our alone time with Him. Oswald Chambers in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, said, We must continually look back to the foundation of our love and affection and remember where our source of power lies. When Saul began to worship Jesus, the most zealous person to stop the gospel became the most zealous person to spread the gospel. In Acts, Paul was telling King Agrippa the story of his encounter with Jesus Christ, and he said, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. Paul's saying he, he couldn't ignore what he saw. It was a, a life-changing revelation to encounter the living God. Furthermore, true worship of God energizes a Christian it replenishes us when we go back to the heart of worship. Even our joy is elevated when we praise the wondrous God of the universe. The heart of worship is really about who God is. If I love my wife only because of the nice things she does for me, that's not really love at all, is it? I love Maria because of the person she is. You know, there's a, there's a blessing in starting 
a relationship from long distance. When Marie and I were getting to know each other, she was in Colombia and I was in Florida. We were communicating through emails and phone calls. Now, during that time, Maria didn't do anything for me and I didn't do anything for her. We couldn't. We, we were apart. I fell in love with Maria's heart as I got to know her from long distance. Even today, I know more of Maria's heart and my love for her continues to deepen. It's the same in our relationship with God. The more we know Jesus, the more we'll love Him. The more we'll worship His excellent greatness. When I met Jesus on my road to Damascus, His tender love and grace flooded my soul with light. I needed His light. I was wandering in the dark. I needed to know His love because I didn't know love. I needed His grace because there was no way I could help myself. God's intervention in my life showed me what His heart is like, what motivates Him, what His ultimate plan is, what my identity is, my future, my worth. Why do I say all of this? so that we'll worship God more intensely, not just because of what He's done for us, but more importantly, because of who He is. Let me encourage you to get back to the heart of worship, to begin each day with what Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. But maybe you're saying it's, it's hard to worship God when I've got so many questions. When storms come our way, we say, why did this happen, God? Why all the, why all the suffering? What are, you, what are you trying to show me? God stretched out the vastness of the universe, but the display of His power was not made complete because the universe has boundaries. God created the stars, but their display was not perfect because a more beautiful display was coming. God spoke light into existence, but it wasn't the brightest light. A brighter light was coming. God revealed His power by making the oceans deep, but something deeper had yet to be revealed. God revealed His love by making man, but a greater love had yet to be revealed. When God revealed His Son Jesus to the world, Jesus appeared weak, and helpless on the cross. He was naked, bleeding, and suffering, but a display of God's power and love was being made perfect through the sacrifice. Jesus defeated sin and death through the suffering. Now God could have used His great power to avoid the cross. Instead, He wanted to demonstrate His love for us perfectly. In Saul's case, God didn't angrily use His great power to zap Saul out of existence. God displayed His love and grace through Saul. God's love and grace brought Saul into his family, and God used him to spread the gospel. Before the Damascus road, Saul breathed out hatred for the gospel. But after Saul encountered the living God, he breathed out love for the gospel. It's not much different for you and I. God will meet us on our road to Damascus and display His power and His grace in us. That's His cause. Acts 9, 31 says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. How can you and I enjoy peace regardless of the crazy times that we live in? How can we be strengthened when we have fears and doubts? Bring your case before the Lord with prayers and petitions. Spend time with 
the Prince of Peace. He'll never leave you or forsake you, regardless of your feelings. The more time we spend with the Prince of Peace, the more our causes fade and our passion for Him increases. And when we do these things, it helps us to get back to the heart of worship in everything that we do. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask for strength to follow you, Lord, in these times that we live in. Help us to stay focused on you, Lord. Your word tells us that you, you're the Prince of Peace, Lord, and that you're, you freely give us your peace, Lord. So we just ask that to surround the body of Christ, Lord. And we just ask that your word, Lord, would, would come out in action in our life that would bear fruit for you and that we would change this world, Lord, the only hope that we have, Lord. And we praise you and we worship you for who you are and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.